Before digital projectors, before PowerPoint presentations, before smart boards, there were transparencies. I know because I was in middle school and transparencies were hot, literally. I can see the halogen bulb and hear the sound of that fan. I can even feel those grooves in the manual focusing and magnifying mechanism. My math teacher at the time was committed, and I mean committed, to this medium of instruction. She drew, and she drew, and she drew. Then to edit or erase whatever was being projected, be it obtuse angles, congruent triangles, or hypotenuses, she bypassed the soap and water. The finger and saliva method was her go-to. We were middle school students now, and so you can imagine how we handled the fact that our geometry teacher's face was covered in marker residue. Advent may not ask us to write geometric proofs. Advent does, however, involve teaching and learning. The characters are introduced to us by the pages of scripture and by tradition. The church is our classroom. We gather there with mental images not only of Jesus, we all have those, but also of John the Baptist and Mary. When it's my turn to draw for you, or for others, the stuff of these lessons of Advent, I feel a flicker of something like fear. There's a chance that I will be that math teacher, that I will be the one with that ink all over the corner of my face. Others might get a kick out of the way I go about it, and that's about it. I'm talking about this third Sunday in Advent. Isaiah is envisioning the return of the redeemed. John the Baptist is jailed. And Mary is magnificating. She is rejoicing in God. Nothing to fret over if you were the illustrator. What we hear in her song, though, is related to what we think about the one doing the singing. And thus my source of angst. Roman Catholics celebrate her capacity to intercede on our behalf. The Eastern Orthodox honor her with that title, Theotokos, meaning God-bearer. Some Protestants commend her as an outstanding example of faith, and that's it. While other Protestants have maintained a measure of the devotion that was more or less uncontested prior to the 16th century. Oh my. There are vigilantes guarding her virginity. There is a militia maintaining the revolutionary quality of statements like the arm of the Lord has scattered the proud. God has cast down the mighty from their thrones, sent the rich away empty. Come Sunday, all of them may be there. When the liturgist or the reader announces that this morning's lesson comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. It's as if Mary has been drawn and the teacher has asked us for our input. Some of us have made our way to the projector to lick our finger and brush away at what's theirs. Others of us have reached for a marker to add what is missing. The transparency sheet is in rough shape. It's hard to make out what we are seeing. It is difficult to decipher what God may intend for us to experience. And so I wonder about pulling out a new piece of that transparency film and beginning again. I'm not suggesting that we trash all of the Marian renderings that have been projected in the past, only that we set them aside for a moment so that we can draw Mary freely, freshly. With the Magnificat as our inspiration, her opening lyrics would be a great place to start. Since her soul magnifies the Lord and her spirit rejoices in God, her Savior, we might sketch her in a posture of joy. Perhaps her arms are raised, her palms face upward. Her lips are parted in the way that lips part when we humans sing. But that was probably already there in those images we tabled. 
No one, after all, was really out to characterize her as a non-rejoicer. The opportunity has to do with where Mary is and with whom she rejoices. The opening for the preacher or the disciple or the seeker is tied to her location and her company. She is in the hill country. She is with Elizabeth. Luke says so in the verses leading up to these. Problem is for many of us that this literary unit is put in front of us just once every three years. This chapter and this part of this chapter has Christmas written all over it, and as such, it surfaces infrequently. Infrequently enough to diminish the odds of us drawing Elizabeth into our portrait of Mary. But Elizabeth is there, and we need to draw her. We need to draw her for Mary's sake. Mary is not singing her song nowhere in particular. Her feet are rooted in the ground, the ground on which Elizabeth and Zechariah have made a home and a life. This ought to make us want to reach for that brown marker and insert some thread-like squiggly lines downward from Mary's feet. And maybe after that, we would sketch a circle around the two of them to signify the kind of space in which this is all unfolding, because this is some space. Space made sacred by God, but also by Elizabeth, her hospitality and her blessing, her ability to lead worship in a way that calls forth a proclamation as remarkable as the one that comes up and out of Mary as though it had been fire shut up in her bones. Mary sings all right on the heels of Elizabeth's invocation. How Luke has teed this moment up like only a masterful called by God storyteller could. You see, Elizabeth's husband is the priestly one. We've been told that much, how Zechariah stands at the right side of the altar of incense at the temple, the very center of things, but it is off the grid that the fireworks of God are taking to the sky, and it is Elizabeth's and Mary's joyful, prophetic back and forth that strikes the match. Elizabeth has a ministry, and Mary's song may be the fruit it bears. Mary may be about to bear God, but Elizabeth's ministry is bearing fruit in and through Mary. When we draw Mary without trying to capture the quality of space Elizabeth cultivates, we make an island out of a woman who is called to be and to do something that could not be farther from a solo project. These two in this moment are a twosome. They are iron on iron in the way that the proverb commends. If ever there was a holy egging on of another, it is here in Luke 1. But the iron on iron effect goes beyond what Elizabeth is for Mary. When Mary sings about how God has lifted up the lowly and has filled the hungry with good things and has come to the aid of Israel, this is our cue. Additional company has entered the frame. The words to her song illumine a vast array of holy instigators, her spiritual ancestors from whom she has learned how to express this longing to be saved and to be set free. Drawing Mary means finding a way to convey the whole people of God streaming into this powerful moment of hill country worship. Mary rejoices in the story. She rejoices in this thing we call salvation history and in the role she's been asked to play. She sings us into the presence of God and into the one company of hope that is gifted to us by synagogue and church. Her song has a gathering effect. The Spirit is at work to ensure that God will be born not only through her, but also among us. It would seem that God, like my middle school math teacher, is committed to a way of doing things, to a particular medium of saving grace. 
relationships. There's this story about a rabbi and the time he was invited to enter the pearly gates. The rabbi is given the nod, told to come on through, but the moment gives him pause. He couldn't have been a rabbi, he thinks, without his students. Shouldn't they be entering with him? St. Peter thinks about it and agrees all the students will be allowed to enter. The rabbi, however, remains hesitant. He was only able to be a rabbi because he was a Jew. Shouldn't the entire Jewish nation be allowed to enter? St. Peter mulls it over. Yes, he decides the entire Jewish nation could enter based on the rabbi's holiness. Still, the rabbi doesn't move. He wouldn't have been able to be a Jew, he realizes, if it weren't for the Gentiles who singled him out and persecuted them, shouldn't all Gentiles also be allowed to go into heaven based on his holiness? Here, as the story goes, St. Pete draws the line. No, the rabbi's holiness could not bring in all the Gentiles. The story ends with the rabbi outside the gates. He realizes he would have to wait it out or work it out, rather. All the people who have made him him must come with him. Mary's portrait might show her channeling a similar kind of determination and focus. She is not content to rejoice in the honor of her selection. She does not rejoice in having been immaculately conceived or in her virginity or in the fact that she will be a model of the ideal woman or in whatever else we have said about her, which is not to argue for or against any of those beliefs, but rather to put them in perspective. After reaching for that fresh transparency sheet and drawing a portrait from scratch, maybe what we see is the incredible way in which she brings people with her to Bethlehem, which is good news. Better than any news I received in middle school math class just when I think I may have completed this experiment of a portrait, there is reason to reach for the markers one last time. Friends, Mary has sung you into the picture. Mary has sung me there. And looking up at the screen as if we were in a math class, we see the hill country. We see Elizabeth. We see the faithful from ages past. We see ourselves. In other words, we see Mary, she's got us. We will be there when God comes and we see God magnified. For Advent, a season to egg each other on. For this day that God gives us to live life patterned by that call and response rhythm we learn and worship and recognize in the lives of those we meet in the scriptures. For space made sacred, for the exchange of bold and enlivening words. For the opportunity to bring out what is most beautiful and most true in each other while birthing God's salvific work. Sing, y'all. Cap the markers. Welcome back the other portraits inspired by other people, places, and passages in the name of holy instigation. As iron sharpens iron, our brothers and sisters who say to one another, I rejoice. The Almighty has done great things and will do great things again.